I invite you to take your Bibles at this time and turn with me. The book of 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel. Chapter 9. We end the second month of a new year. I just want to take the time this morning and just bless your heart this morning from the word of God. From this book of 2 Samuel, chapter 9. I'd like you to stand with me and we're going to begin reading verse number one. It reads, and David said, is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. And when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan had yet a son, which is lame on his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he is in the house of Micah, the son of Amiel, in Lodibar. Then King David sent and fetched him out of the house of Micah, the son of Amiel, from Lodibar. And when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all, all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread of my table continually, continually. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? Then the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertaineth to Saul and to all his house. Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him. Thou shalt bring in fruits and thy master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, thy servant's son, shall eat bread always at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then said Ziba unto king, according to all that my lord, the king, has commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of king's sons. Amen. Then Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all that dwell in the house of Ziba were servants of Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table and was lame on both his feet. Lord, comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. The subject this morning is titled, New Year, Same Grace. New Year, Same Grace. On a truck, 
owned by a plumbing company. There is this advertisement that promotes their business saying the following. There is no place too deep, too dark, or too dirty for us to handle. There is no place too deep, too dark, or too dirty for us to handle. That could also be said of the grace of God. There is no place that is too deep for the grace of God. There is no place that is too dark for the grace of God. And there is no place that is too dirty for the grace of God. To me, 2 Samuel chapter 9 is a beautiful chapter which illustrates one of the greatest truths in all of the Bible, the grace of a living God. In this chapter, there is amazing grace, active life-changing grace, and also abundant grace. From today's text, I want to draw your attention to three realities of grace. The first reality I want you to consider is the reality that God's grace is always amazing, isn't it? God will not cease to amaze us with his grace. The song Amazing Grace holds a deep and profound meaning that resonates with many believers. And in it, the writer wrote this. He said, Amazing Grace How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Another songwriter said, There is no other name for grace but amazing. In today's text, Jesus asked an amazing question. Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness or favor? Or grace? David is asking this awesome question because he is uh, a man who has gone through an awful relationship with Saul. And that is because Saul was consumed by jealousy and wanted to kill David. However, Saul eventually died. And David ascended to the throne But it was common in that day, when a king died, that the king that followed him would wipe out the entire family. It happens in the animal kingdom, especially lions do that. Oh, my friends, almost out of the blue, David asked if there was anyone, anyone, anyone. He didn't name anyone. He said, is there anyone in Saul's household that I can bless? Not for his sake, but for Jonathan's sake. Do you know what makes the gospel of Jesus Christ amazing? is that Jesus gives every single person on the face of the earth an invitation to be a part of his family. Oh, my friends, I want you to consider the following rhetorical questions carefully and honestly. Be honest. You're in church. Would you instantly desire to comfort someone who has just taken advantage of you, abused your trust, or carelessly acted against your direction, would you be quick to comfort that person? If you were punched in the face over and over and over and over and over again by someone punched to the point of where the knuckles will become sore, would you instantly run to find some ice to put on their aching knuckles? 
Perhaps the overwhelming response this morning would be, Pastor, no way. I would need time to cool down, and then I will consider whether I will do that. But let me tell you something. Two, over 2,000 years ago, that's exactly what Jesus did. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says, God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, while we were taking advantage of God's grace, while we were abusing his trust, while we were carelessly acting against his direction. He loved us enough to die for us. You see, this thing called grace is an unearned blessing of God. It is freely given because of what Jesus did on our behalf, not what we did. Oh, it cannot be earned, dissolved, or performed for. All it can be done with the grace of God is simply received. What God, grace does is strip the flesh of all its glory as it's revealed in the word of God so that everything be by God and not us. So that everything be for God and not us. So that God be given the glory and not us. That's what the grace of God does. You see, beloved, if the grace of God is not amazing, then what is? What is? Is my question. Amazing grace is something, my friends, that is just that. Amazing. Someone wrote a song title, I don't know if this is a title, but it, it, it says, he looked beyond my faults and saw my needs. It says, amazing grace shall always be my song of praise. For it was grace that brought my liberty. I do not know just why he cared to love me so. He looked beyond my faults and he saw my need. I shall forever lift my mind eyes to Calvary to view the cross where Jesus died for me then the writer said how marvelous the grace that caught my falling soul he looked beyond your faults my faults and he saw our need that's grace this leads us to a simple but important principle and the principle is this. Grace is simply love in action. That's all grace is. It is God not just saying, I love you. But God showing that he loves us. Oh, my friends, this grace is amazing. But my second reality is this. Reality number one is that the grace of God is amazing, but the second reality out of the tree is this, that his grace is always, again, always active in changing lives. That is seen in our story. Oh, my friends, in 2 Samuel 9, 3 to 5, it says, and the king said, is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto him, Jonathan hath yet a son, which is lame on his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he is in the house of Maker, the son of Amiel, in Lodibar. Get this now. He has grace. David could have said, Go and kill him. But then David sent and fetched him out of the house of Maker, the son of Amiel from Lodi Bar. In these three verses, there are three things. There is restoration, there is forgiveness, and you will find transformation. Mephibosheth was living north in a place called Lodi Bar. 
Now, perhaps your first time you're seeing this word Lodibar. What is Lodibar? Let me put it in our language or in our day. Lodibar is a ghetto town. It's a ghetto. Oh, my friends, in the ghetto, you find disappointment. You find destruction. You find um, discouragement. You find bondage. You find hopelessness. You find fear. You find total prob- um, 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 poverty. And Mephibosheth was destined to a life of hopelessness. Not long ago, a submarine sank. And when it sank, they were looking for it and they found by sonar this submarine. But someone in that sub knew the Morse code or, or you know, that tap, tap, tap that you do to communicate Morse code. And they put down sonars and they heard tapping. And the tapping was this. Is there any hope? They're surrounded by water in the depths of the sea. And the question is simply, is there any hope? And I'm sure that Mephibosheth many times thought to himself, is there any hope for me? But you know what? Grace changed all that. Praise God, grace changed his situation. And so also can grace change your situation if only you will let Jesus walk on your situation and your behalf. You see, sometimes we go through life and we go through situations in life and we tell God, God, uh, hold on there, I'll get to you when, if I need you. If I need you, I'll get to you. And we try to fix it and when it messed up, then we say, God, here. Take it, fix it. Oh, my friend, God wants to be at the center of your life. And through grace, fix your situation. But you see, this man, fallen man, the Bible teaches us that we were under a death sentence. Dead, Ephesians says, in trespasses and sin. Ephesians chapter 2, though, comes around, and here is the restoration part. And it teaches us that followers of Jesus Christ have hope. Don't look down to their brothers. Don't look down to their sisters. Don't feel as though everything is lost. Don't feel as though everything is hopeless. Because as long as God's word exists, which he says, my word shall last forever, you can hold on to that promise. That says nothing is hopeless as long as God is in it. And that's why Ephesians says to us in verses number four, beginning at verse four, <clears throat> God who is rich, can I have some water, babes? In mercy for his great love wherein he loved us, even when we were dead in sin, have quickened us together with Christ. For by grace... Are ye saved? And hath raised us to up together and made us sit together, get this, in heavenly places. But in Christ Jesus. It says that in the ages to come, He might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. And Paul says again, for by grace are ye saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. And today God is still calling men. He's still calling women. He's still calling boys. He's still calling girls, my friends, out of their spiritual lowly bar places. And he made it possible for you and I to not be living in destruction, in bondage, in hopelessness, and isolation from him. Oh, there's something else about Mephibosheth that I want you to understand. Not only was he in this place called lowly bar, but Mephibosheth was delivered free of charge. 
God's grace is not about achieving, but about receiving. I say again, God's grace is not about achieving, but about receiving. What Mephibosheth received is grace for his disgrace. That's what he got. You see, God don't always give us what we deserve. There are times that God will surprise us by giving us his grace for our disgrace. But I want you to notice twice in this passage, I'm not going to read it, but in verses number three, and in the last verse in this chapter, it says that Mephibosheth was lame on both feet. What this tells us is that Mephibosheth had nothing to offer David. He was a lame man. He had to depend upon David for everything. Oh, like Mephibosheth, I don't care how wealthy you are. I don't care how poor you are. I don't care what position you have in good government. I don't care what position you have in society, my friends. All of us, like Mephibosheth, need God's grace. We need to depend upon God's favor. We need, if we are lost, to depend upon God's salvation. And if you think you made it on your own, let me remind you of Alex Haley. Alex Haley had a picture on, in, his, in his office. And in his office, the picture was a turtle on a pole. Whenever people walked into his office, Alex Haley, that author of the, the book Roots, Alex Haley, would, he would be asked the question, what is the meaning of that turtle on that fence post? And Alex would always say to them, it always reminds me that somebody had to get me to where I am. Brothers and sisters, somebody got you to where you are today. And it is only by the grace of God. That's the only way. Oh, the love that drew salvation plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God disbanded at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my body and soul found liberty. At that place called Calvary, never forget Calvary. That's where grace, my friends, was demonstrated for all mankind upon Calvary. There was a man who had a dream. And in his dream, he said, I dreamt that I was at heaven's gate. He says, I dreamt. That when I pass away, I notice a signpost that read, entry requires 1,000 points. And then he dreamed, in his dream, he said he walked up to the angel. And he said to the angel, okay, I'm going to get in. Because, age 32, I taught a Sunday school class for 12 years. I was in the youth department as a volunteer. I was a faithful member of the church. And the angel turned to him and said, that's one point. The man suddenly began to sweat. But he went on and he said, I tied all my income. I served as an elder in the church. I served on the finance committee. I attended every work day the church had. I mowed the grass. I repaired. I painted. I, I, I did. I, 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 did fellowship suppers in my house and invited others. The angel said, okay, you got two points. Remember, it's a thousand points. He needs. He looked at the angel and he smiled politely. That sounds great, the angel said. But the man says, said again, while being in shock, he says, my friend, I invited a lot of people to church. People came as a result of me. He says, I, 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 I never cheated on my income tax. The angel looked at him and said, okay, 
For that, right now you have three points. The poor man's face sagged and it drooped. And he said, I have a thousand points that I need to make up and only three of them. Oh, how else can I make it into heaven but by the grace of God? And the angel says, you got it, buddy. <laughs> you got it. Because you see right now, you're standing in the wrong line. You're standing in the walks line. And you see that line over there where you see few people, not too many, but few. He says, that's the line you get into when you go there and you get in absolutely free of charge. Why? Because everything that you need to get to heaven has been done upon Calvary on your behalf. And therefore, you don't need a point system. All you need is the grace of God. I wonder if some of us here today are standing at the wrong gate. Brothers and sisters, if you find yourself standing at the walk's gate, switch gate and run to the grace gate. Salvation is by grace through faith in Christ. Finish walk upon the cross, plus nothing, minus nothing. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. I said to you, I'm giving you three realities of God's grace, and here's the third and last one. Look at our text, 2 Samuel 9, and look at verse 13. Verse 13, the last verse. So Mephibosheth dwell in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually. Get that word? Continually, perpetually, also at the king's table, and was lame on both feet. There was nothing that Mephibosheth deserved, nothing. And I said to us here today, there is nothing that we deserve from God but hell's fire. And I say that not with a condemning heart, but I say it with a truthful heart. Because the word of God tells us plain and simple, if we are not in Christ, we are lost and on our way to hell. And anything that we get is because of the goodness of God. God's grace is not only powerful enough to forgive us of our sins, but listen to me, hang in there for a few minutes, more minutes, and I want to tell you that it is powerful enough to withstand the power of sin and Satan. The grace of God can give us the power that we need to withstand sin and Satan. And some people say, you know, the Christian life is so hard to live, and I have been there. I know it's hard to live. I know how it is to come to church on Sunday. You say, God, I'm going to live for you tomorrow. And as tomorrow comes, sometimes even when you get home, there's that temptation. There's that trial. There's that sin. And it is true. The Christian life is not a walk in the park. But when you learn to depend upon the sustaining grace of Jesus Christ, it is possible to live for Christ. And my third point, I don't know if I mentioned it, but God's grace is always abundant. God's sustaining grace is the ability to help you keep going even when you're tired of life's problems. It is the grace of God that says to you, go on, go on. You have failed, but get up and go on. You have stumbled, but get up and go on. You know something? Every single person that you read of in the Bible, Moses, David, Paul, every single one of them had shortcomings. 
Every single one of them stumbled. But you know what's the difference between a winner and a loser? A loser stumbles and a loser falls. And he stays down there and he says, oh, poor me, why me? Oh, 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 and he complains. But a winner, even though in this race of life, he stumbles and falls. He looks around to see who's watching. But he gets up. He gets up and he's on his way again. You see? God did not call us to be losers. God called you. God called you to be a winner. And the only way you're going to make it till the end is by the grace of God. That's the only way we're going to make it to the end of this life. Amazing grace is something not only that helps us through temptations and trials, but it enables us to live to see another day. You know, if it wasn't for the grace of God, this church would be empty. It would be empty because I have failed God so many times, and so have you. And if God was not a loving God, if God was not a gracious God, we will not live to see another day. Oh, the song says, the Lord has promised good to me, his word my hope secure. He will my shield and pardon me as long as life endure. If you look close and honest, look at your life. Every day that you live, you will see where God has been good to you. You will see with God, even though you have not been faithful, God still remained faithful. Look closely. Some of us are here today and we know this week, we didn't have a godly week, so to speak, but for the grace of God. Oh, my friends, take a closer look. And perhaps there is someone here today or someone listening today. You can remember years ago, the doctor said to you, I'm giving you six months, I'm giving you one year, I'm giving you two years to live. And you have outlived your doctor. <laughs> Praise God. I know that there is somebody as a young person, you decided I'm going to college, but I have, don't have the money to get in. But you said, I'm, I'm going to trust God. And somehow or another, you got into college. It's by the grace of God. Maybe you've been in a car crash, and doctors said there's no hope. Family says, there's no hope. Or perhaps, let me bring it down to something simpler. Perhaps you were speeding. Here in St. Croix, I don't know why people speed in St. Croix, but you were speeding. And when you were speeding, you heard, <laughs> you pulled over. Hey, take a break here and <laughs> tell you about the incident with me. I was rushing to church and I know I was speeding. And behind me, the police car put on his light. And I pulled over. I said, oh, no, no, definitely I'm going to reach late to church. I pulled over and... <laughs> he, was, he was going to another car. God for his grace. <laughs> oh, my friends, maybe you did not get a ticket sometime this year or maybe last year. You know why? The grace of God. You know you were wrong, but the grace of God. 
Perhaps you have had a tumultuous and sinful past. Family said, I give up on him. I give up on her. Perhaps the, 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 the government system has given up on you because you've been in and out of prison. Perhaps you're out there and you're listening to me. And you said, I've been in, I've been out, and every time I come out, I go back in, and family don't want anything to do with me. The government system said, oh, it's you again. Nothing good do people have to say about you. But one day, Jesus got a hold of you. He touched your heart. He touched your life. And today, by the grace of God, you are a new creation in Jesus Christ. Oh, you know that the Lord has been good to you, brothers and sisters. And you know for the rest of 2024, I don't know about us being good to him, but we can count on the fact that he will be good to us. So us, God's sustaining grace does not empower you to, 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 to only um, stand against temptations and see another day. But it helps us for when we have come to the end of our lives to make it safely through the valley of death. When you put your trust in the Lord, we should not fear death. Oh, my friends, because God will lead us home. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Tis grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. The story of David and Mephibosheth gives us a small, just a small glimpse of who God is. A God that loves us, favors us, keeps us, strengthens us, and sustains us in life from now into eternity. You see, we, we counsel people for salvation, and one of the things we say, and I hope you, you learn something today, we tell them, well, now, you can look forward to being in heaven and have eternal life. Brothers and sisters, the Bible teaches that the minute we trust Jesus as our Savior, eternal life begins. And if you live 30, 40, 50, 60 years after receiving Jesus, you are experiencing eternal life. And you don't have to wait to die to experience eternal life. It starts the moment someone puts the trust and confidence in Jesus. Oh, my friends, if you are here today and you have never trusted Jesus, you're missing a whole lot. It was art link letter, just before I close, who said Walt Disney invited him to California. It was this vast stretch of land. And Walt Disney said to Art link letter, I have a dream. My dream is to one day build an amusement park. And Lynn Leonard looked at him as though he was crazy. Well, Link Linkletter uh, said, as I listened to him and we walked, he told me, he said, what I want you to do is buy property around the property that I am going to purchase for this dream. Uh, Link Lecker said, not me. He refused to invest. As a result, we know in California you have what, Disneyland? And if Art Link letter, he said, I regret not buying a property around Disney. He said, because Walt told me, he says, you buy that land, I'm going to buy this land, you buy around me, and you can build hotels to house the people. He said, not me. But if you look at it today, what do we see? He said, 
what are you getting at, Pastor? It is this, listen carefully. Art Linkletter testified that every step that he took could have been one million dollars in his pocket. Every step. Walt didn't tell him how much the land would be worth now. But he says, I rejected the offer. I rejected the offer. What am I getting at? Be careful with what you reject in life. The greatest investment that you can make in your life is trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. But so many walk away from that offer only later to regret it because they miss out on the riches that there is in Jesus. Jesus offers you his grace. And he offers you his love through his grace. He says, believe and you shall receive. For those of you who are saved and you know it, don't allow anyone to fall short of God's grace. In other words, don't keep it to yourself. You see what David did? Do that. Find someone that needs Jesus and share Jesus with them. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father and dear God, we, we have so much and yet so little gratitude. Some of us have little, but in you have found much. If there be anyone there, Lord, this day that has been alien to your grace, more so to you, dear Lord. And perhaps it's because they, they don't see themselves worthy as, as Mephibosheth, which I didn't get into. But Mephibosheth got to the point where he says, I'm a dead dog. I'm a nobody. And yet David accepted him, cared for him for the rest of his life. And so you too, want to let us understand that that's what you want to do. Help us to be partners with you in the sharing of this good news that there is a God who is always gracious. There's no place too deep, too dark, or too dirty that you cannot reach us. I say to you today, don't leave here today knowing that you are not sure if heaven will be your home without coming to me or one of the leaders today and say, I want salvation. I want Jesus. Don't do that. Don't leave today without committing your life to God and saying to him, Lord, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to your cross I cling. It's not about me, Lord, but all about you. And as a recipient of his grace, be gracious and share the gospel with others. you're here today I don't want to leave or take it for granted that everybody is here is safe but here's an offer that God is giving to you it's extending I should say to you the offer of eternal life through him and if you raise your hand and say pastor I need prayer in this prayer that I'm going to pray, I'm going to pray for you. 
I'm asking you to come forward. I'm asking you to just hold your hand in the air, raise your hand in the air, and say, pray for me. That I'll do what God wants me today so I don't miss out. And I promise you'll do it. If not, you're free to remain where you are and we are dismissed.